So, Seamus, I know we're going to take turns playing No Man's Sky. Did you take your turn this week already? My turn. Uh, my turn is I launched the game and it froze at the main menu. So then oh, no. I... So then I exited and I tried it again and it froze at the main menu. So then I exited again and I did a, you know, refresh, like, uh, verify all files to make sure the install is good. And mm. then I ran it again and it froze at the main menu. So then I uninstalled it and all user data completely and reinstalled the whole thing and it worked again. Um, but by that time I was out of time and it was almost time for the show. So, um, that's all I did. I installed No Man's Sky. Um, what I did play this week is Tough as Nails Minecraft. Hmm. Is that a mod or an entirely separate game that shares the name? It's a mod. Now, this is something I've been looking for for a long time. I wanted a... I wanted something that kind of gives the Don't Starve... If you remember the game Don't Starve... Oh, yeah. Really like Don't Starve, but I kind of... I hated the combat in Don't Starve. Like, I loved everything about Don't Starve, but the there was a lot of combat, and I hated it. I just... I thought it felt awful, and I was like, it would be cool to have all the mechanics of Don't Starve in Minecraft. Like the hunger and temperature and stuff. Right. And I I found one mod that supposedly did that. It was called RL Craft, real life craft. It's all about realism. And then the, it, it's actually just a troll mod. Like the, the author has sort of an example video of him playing it. And he like spawns for the first time, walks five feet. And a frog walks up to him and kills him in one hit. I don't know, maybe it's poison or something. His spawn, walk 10 feet, a dragon, you know, rushes down, obliterates you. So you're apparently in, in real life craft. You're, you're apparently not at the, your man is not an apex predator. <laughs> man is nowhere near the top of the food chain. Everything else is above him. And you're just constantly being murdered by everything you meet. And it has needs to meet too, but I mean, it just like that's not the experience I'm looking for. The extra combat wasn't what you're, the direction you wanted to go. No, especially not just ridiculous, over the top, nonsensical. You have to like get in a life or death struggle with every hedgehog between here and the tree you want to punch down. How would you even like, punch down a tree in real life, craft? That doesn't work. Right, right. I don't even know. So that, did, but then I found Hard as Nails Minecraft, which is, which promised to be, what I was looking for. And I was pretty excited. Um, the only, but then I was kind of disappointed because the temperature model is really half baked. Mm. It, I can see what they're trying to do, but like, there's not a lot of perceivable consequence. Like, I was in a prairie and dying of heat stroke. Now, you can okay. get, it. you know, it's like a grassy place. Now, you can have really hot days where, you you know, you've got to stay cool. But dying of heat stroke in the space of an hour on a prairie doesn't make a lot of sense. Especially if you have access to water. Right. Well, that's what you're supposed to do is... uh. Well, I don't know if it's supposed to do. The the way to deal with it is to carry around a bucket of water. And you're like, oh, start to get overheated. So you dig a little hole, pour your bucket of water into it, jump in the hole. Soak for two seconds, oh. jump back out. Now you're good for another 15 seconds. And this is something... Uh, <laughs> right? So it's like, you can't really... Like in... Okay. In Don't Star... I meant to drink. Water to drink. You don't... You don't make a, a wallowing pool. Right. Uh, drinking water does not cool you down. Which, yeah, what the heck? Drinking water doesn't cool you down? What even? That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, in Don't Starve, you can get um, this heat stone. You, 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 know, you make this stone, you put it in the fire, it heats up, and then you put it in your pocket and it keeps you warm. And that'll let you stray from your campfire for a while. And, you know, that'll give you a good five minutes of running around in the open world before it's like, oh, stone's getting cold. 
I'm going to I'm going to start to freeze if I don't, you know, get back to the fire and warm back up. So you mm -hmm. so you you know, make you venture out in short little trips. It would be pointless if like just you didn't have that stone and you you had no way to leave camp. You just had to build campfires everywhere you went, every 20 feet. Uh -huh. And that's, yeah. Or build yourself a little wallowing hole every 20 feet. And that's that's what's going on with Hard as Nails Minecraft. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah. the it doesn't seem to take into account if you're wearing armor or what kind of armor. It doesn't take into account if you're drinking. It doesn't make a lot of sense with the it's like really sensitive about climates you know dying dying of heat stroke on a prairie <laughs> it's just come on in and in, in a very short time you know this should be something that it's like oh you've been exposed for an extended period of time now you're going to start taking damage but no it's just like uh uh Ugh. Like, like you're being constantly hit with a weapon. <laughs> it's just... So is this like, does shade protect you from from heat? No. Well, well it's, it's hard to tell. Like, I, um... Like if you're in a cave or something. I had, uh, I was digging down once, and it, and I started to overheat. I'm like, well, I'm way underground, I mean, way underground now. And I'm overheating, like, it's kind of known, like, most caves are just, what, like, 50 degrees Fahrenheit year-round. Like, once you get down mm -hmm. so far, you're just that that fixed temperature. Um, yeah. But no, in this mod, I guess, when you go deep, it's just so hot all the time. So, like, what's that all about? <laughs> It feels like they wanted to make it gamey. Oh, it needs to be trying to kill you at every moment. And, you know, I I think it works better when it's about planning trips, making sure you have enough supplies. But if you are properly supplied when you've got the gear, you shouldn't be near, you know, you shouldn't be having a brush with death every single day. <laughs> I mean... As evidence of that, humans managed to survive into the modern age. Mm -hmm. So, like, survival yeah, is possible. Silly. Yeah, it, it it's um, I could see the I can see the thinking when you're making a mod, you're you're thinking about your mod being the only thing somebody's playing, and you're like, well, oh, I've got to justify this mod existing. It's got to be do you have to be interacting with it all the time. And it has to be providing you with content and challenge all the time. As opposed to, oh, this is just part of a larger collection of mods, you know, to to make a certain style of game. Mm, right. Or or something that exposes more controls to the user so they can shape their experience how they want. Right. Right. I would have. I, I actually liked how the it handled water. It's like oh, you can just drink water if you want. Um, but like it's better to filter water, and you know you could use charcoal, and you build this little water filter with sand and charcoal. Hmm. And I'm like, no, oh, that's kind of cool. And it's it's uh, you know, it's like if you drink unfiltered water, it doesn't immediately poison you to death. It's just uh, oh, once in a once in a while, you know, once in every. I don't know, 20 sips, you'll get sick for 10 seconds where you'll be like extra thirsty or something. Instead of quenching your thirst, you'll get more thirsty. Hmm. Um, that might be, you know, that's probably a bit much, but that's not outrageous. It's a, it's a minor hindrance, you know, to encourage you to drink properly filtered water. That's cool. So like that much of it works and it, it feels like well, I guess this is a, a complicated type of game to design. And it, you know, I guess it's hard for, you know, to expect the community to be able to do it. When when most mod packs are like these Frankenstein monsters of 10 different mods all rammed together. Anyway, that's tough as nails Minecraft. It might be good in another few revisions. <laughs> Somebody just needs to turn down the, the temperature game. <laughs> yeah, or at, or at least make it like contingent on being exposed to skylight because that's something that's tracked in minecraft it's not like you have to figure that out right it does seem to do it somewhat i did notice i was getting heat stroke 
I was out in my garden, again, temperate, you know, I think there were pine trees around, and I'm dying of, you know, it's it's 10 a.m., and I'm dying of heat stroke again. <laughs> and I went into my house, and I stopped dying of heat stroke. And I'm like, oh, but only if I was on one side of my house. On the other side of my house, I was still dying of it. And I'm like, is that because the <laughs> furnace is over there? How far does the furnace reach? <laughs> like, what how th this is what i was talking about perceivable consequence it was never really clear like i'd put on armor take off armor start up a furnace and stand next to it to try and keep warm and that wouldn't seem to have any effect and it's like i can't the things the player does to control their own temperature are very mild and the things that the environmental things that control your temperature are very strong so it just feels random it feels like you have no control over it. Yeah, the difference between a game being difficult and a game just being like a slot machine where you pull the lever and like, right. oh, you're dying of arbitrary. a frog this time. Right, arbitrary. Mm. You get killed by a frog <laughs> 10 seconds after spawning. Well, speaking of games that you can't die in and, uh, and aren't even really games, I made it uh, a kind of a mist-inspired... Uh, I don't know, exploring game back in 1998, and it's still up on my website. A, I you know, clicked JavaScript. through to that, and I clicked through that, and I was very disoriented because it um it seems to change your orientation when you like press forward. Like if you keep pressing forward, it, it changes your orientation. Am I correct there? Mm. Yeah, yeah, it does. It kind of lines you up with the the nearest render. And these are in 640 by 480. Anyway, they, uh, we'll put a link in the thing, and if people want to see it, fine. Um, the point I wanted to make was I was I was working on fixing the game so that it actually accepted keyboard inputs. So it used to be you had to like click on it with the mouse, and right for some reason I got back into it. I was like I, I should really have keyboard inputs. So I I was you know doing that, and at some point um, my daughter saw it, and she's like, oh that's that's kind of neat. Like can I play? I was like sure, yeah, anybody can play. It's free, and so. She was flying around, you know, going places. And then I changed something else and she wanted to get back to where she was. And so I went into the inspector in Firefox, I guess, and uh, went into the Java console and I was going to change the variable that holds your position. And so I copy the the name of the node out from, you know, the I'm editing the file in one window. And so I copy the name over and I go into the, the console in the other window and try to paste it in. And pops up this big error message like hey you should be super careful like pasting stuff into your java console people can hijack your computer and stuff <laughs> and, like you, you don't you probably don't know what you're doing so you like if you really know what you're doing then you have to like do this convoluted thing and i was like what are you are you kidding me so i just typed it in instead of pasting it it's like come on like <laughs> this is so dumb oh oh it was because you were using control v and it was that's what it was worried about. It wasn't worried that you were messing with the Java console. It was worried that you were control Ving into the console. Uh-huh. I guess there's some sort of exploit where a hacker will say, hey, here's this big long string of complicated JavaScript code. Why don't you open up your browser console and paste this in and then backdoor your browser or something? Yeah. I wasn't I wasn't too impressed by those security measures. Right. It's like there are some things it's like if I'm I'm in Linux and the browser knows I'm in Linux and like I can paste commands sudo commands into the command line in Linux and it just happens and Linux is like all right I guess you know what you're up to like if you like that person that's going to paste code into their own Linux into their own Java console that person you can't save that person <laughs> <laughs> like right. the 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 deed is already done they already trust somebody they shouldn't, and they're willing to paste code. You're trying to save them despite the fact and that they don't know what they're doing, and you can't really help them or teach them why this is just, why everything they're doing is wrong. <laughs> right. The, I, the, I, the exploit has already been delivered, but it's been delivered into right. their brain, right? Like, that's the right, problem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I'm almost like, I am almost against this. Like, you can't keep that person safe. And so, like, 
keeping them safe would mean locking down the computer and not letting them use it. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right. Like, you've got to take so much power away from them before that they're safe from themselves. And maybe it's just better that they get exploited now rather than they continue to blunder through life with this much ignorance and just blunder from one near catastrophe to the next, not knowing what they're doing wrong. I guess. You remember that, uh, it was like an email that went around where it told you to like, hey, there's this, this virus on your computer, but if you go to the Windows directory and like delete this one executable, then, you know, you'll like, you'll fix it. And it turns out the executable is like the, the little program that makes it so you can have more than 64 characters in a, in a file name or something. And so then like Windows just dies. I did never heard of that. That's hilarious. It's like, and it wasn't a protected like operating system file or whatever. And so like somebody found this and like, oh, you know, it'd be really cool to have someone like take down their own computer <laughs> based on email instructions. Oh, that's terrible. Like if you did that to somebody's car, it's like, hey, you're gonna, you, there's a problem with your car. You, you know, a billboard by the side of the road. There's a, there's a problem with your car. You're gonna need to crawl all under there and cut the brake lines. <laughs> yeah. Like, Someone, like, someone installed a, a tracking device on your car, but don't worry, it looks like this, and just, like, cut that thing out of there with a hacksaw. Right. And then, and then just at the bottom of that hill is a big pile of cars. <laughs> right. Of all the people that, that did that. The brake line repair shop. <laughs> right. And to a certain extent, like, you, you know, I... I think people have some sort of intuitive understanding on what you should and shouldn't do with your car, but they don't have the same intuitive understanding. You know, computers are just the magic box, mm. and it would be good. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, do schools teach any of this now? Oh, man. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, like, do schools teach you, like... Hey, here's some basic concepts of security and here's the, you know, not specific rules, but just enough knowledge that you can recognize, oh, that's, that's definitely going to, there's no reason for me to crawl under my car and cut this hydraulic line. Right, right. Anytime you're cutting things out of your car, probably is not a good idea. Right. Then you could have that immediate intuitive understanding that this doesn't make sense that this person's probably not telling the truth um and a, a little bit of knowledge i think can get you 90 percent of the way to safety like stuff like um you know paste this into your java console is one of those things that's just going to miss on most people really seems like it must security that is funny well i have a question and I, I hesitate to bring this up because it's a cringe subject. Talking okay. about dr talking about dreams is usually considered really obnoxious. Like, who cares? I don't care what you dreamed. Like, it was a dream. It's not real. Don't tell me about your dream. That's a waste of my time. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. But I've I found this curious pattern in my dreams, and I want to see if I'm the only one. Hmm. I found... I'm gonna try and keep this. I don't want to bore you with my dream, but I'm 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 gonna have to tell you a little <laughs> bit to make sense of this. Okay, so in I, in my family, like, I'll I'll get up in the morning. Sometimes I got a dream, and I talk about it to Anna. And like, if there's a conversation about dreams, then any of the kids who are awake are like, "Oh yeah, I had a dream too." And then just it's like this pandemic of dream, you know, explanations. Right. Um. The pattern in, I've noticed in my dreaming, this has only been in the last year or so, is gameplay logic intruding on my dreams. So a dream, the, the, here's just one example. Like uh, this has happened, this has happened a whole bunch of times in the past year or so. But here's one example. I was some nondescript place and there's somebody, you know, some public place. And there's some guy kind of being a loudmouth bully, pushing people around, being a real jerk. I guess he looks like a cowboy. He's got like a cowboy hat on. He's like carrying a six shooter for some reason. And I'm like, boy, I really want to do something about this guy. But I look over his head and I see that he's level 50. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> the, da the damage scaling. 
no matter how much I shoot him, I'm never going to be able to do much damage to him. I, I guess I have a gun. I don't, you know, I don't, There there's no gun. I'm, I don't hold a gun in the dream, but I'm thinking about this as if I have access to a gun. <laughs> I'm considering right. shooting him and realizing I would just shoot him and I would shoot every bullet I had at him and it would like knock 10% off his health bar. I hate when they do that. That is such bullshit. I hate level-based damage scaling. And I'm sitting there really irritated. And then I come up with this plan where, like, there's a drip coffee maker around. And I grab the pot from that, which is empty. And I'm, like, going to bash him on the head with that. And I guess the logic is, well, that's not gameplay. That's just, you know, real-life violence. <laughs> so that won't <laughs> be subject to damage scaling. And I'll just be able to, you know, knock him out. I'm like, maybe if I could fill this with, like, gravel or something, go outside, fill the coffee pot with gravel and then bash him over the head with it you're waking up i'm like really a, a drip coffee maker that's that's the melee weapon of choice subconscious somebody's coffee maker too like you gotta take that into account and here's a chair call a cop right right but the cops are probably all like capped at level 10 so but i've noticed this this Intruding on my dreams is real, is a dream that seems to take place in, you know, the dream itself is not supposed to be a video game. It's not like, it's not like I'm playing a video game, but video game logic intrudes on the world of the dream. And I wonder, and this, you know, I've been playing games my whole life, but then in the last year, that type of thing has begun happening in dreams where suddenly like the the logic of of game worlds bleeds into the dream um and it's curious why now i'm 50 i'm 50 years old why suddenly now is my subconscious like really concerned with gameplay mechanics hmm. um and am i the only one has this ever happened to you in a dream well i i don't recall uh that specific kind of thing where it's like there's this specific mechanic i i have had quite a few dreams where i i was in a video game or like the the setting of the dream was like in a video game but it the mechanics aren't usually so much uh the factor is like the conceit of the world or whatever like it's a justification for why the world is that way so when you dream that you're in a video game do you dream that it's like crappy graphics or polygonal or does it just look like you know any other dream world uh, I think it's probably any other dream world. I I don't think that there are there are graphical limitations in the in the dream usually. Okay, so this is a very similar idea. It's it's a world where you are able to act more or less as you do in the real world, where you have this freedom to move around and act and think, but there's some sort of video game constraint on it. Hmm. Yeah. That is interesting. I'm, I'm curious if anybody else has stuff like this happen in their dreams. Please leave a comment in the comments below if you have dreamed video game logic. A lot of times for me, it's like I'm, I'm, it, the dream starts by me playing a game and then like it kind of shifts and I'm inside the game. So it's like one of those, it's like a framing thing and then I end up inside the frame. Right. And it's not like you're pulled in, like getting pulled into Tron or into the Matrix. It's just, it's, you know, the dream just sort of bleeds in there without you really noticing. Right. Yeah, I I don't keep accurate um, track of my, you know, I don't keep careful account of my dreams. So um, that sounds familiar, but I can't say for sure that I've gone through that. Like, I, it, this had to happen several times before I began to notice the pattern and started thinking, wait, I've had dreams like that before, haven't I? You you mentioned, uh, you know, having a conversation with your family about dreams. We, we had a thing in our family um, where it was, um, that happened. One morning, I got up. This was, um, when I was a, when I was a teenager. Got up. Oh, I had the weirdest dream last night. Oh, me too. Oh, me too. Everybody, like, either, either talks about their dream or just mentions that they had an intense dream. And then everybody goes on with their day. Then a week later, happens again. I'm like, weird. Last time, this was on a Tuesday night, too. Oh, that is weird. Next Tuesday comes around. Oh, weird dreams last night. And um, the thing is, my mom uh, made meals on a schedule. And 
Tuesday was fish. Or Tuesday <laughs> night we had fish. And my theory, I have no way to prove this, but there was something about the fish that gave everybody dreams. That is really interesting. I know um, magnesium can help you have vivid dreams. Yeah, it might not have been the fish. It might have been something about the way it was prepared or whatever, or the ingredients mm, that went into yeah. it. But it was like, you know, Wednesday, you know, I'm saying Tuesday, but it was like Wednesday morning, everybody would wake up with weird dreams. Huh. Or it could have been a fluke. I don't know. I didn't do a double blind t uh, study. I did not get a research grant and begin studying this phenomena. I just wandered <laughs> around and complained about it until the menu changed. I've had at least one uh, one dream where the where the game, um, like in order to wake up, I had to log out of the game, and so I was like waiting to log out. You know, I used to have to wait to log out on on MMOs. Yes. Oh, that's a, that's annoying. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we got to get to some mailbags. They keep piling up. People are just sending them in, which is great. But uh, we got to get to some of these. Okay. Let's do it. Dear Diecast, I hope this February finds you well. I find myself in a conundrum. I love the game play of Breath of Fire 4, but I can't play it. I can't play Breath of Fire 4. There's a scene where this terrible thing happens. You can read the thing. So I was wondering, are there games where that you guys love to play but simply can't bring yourself to play because of something in the story? Vale, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Uh, for me, it's harm coming to children. I, I, can't, I can't do it. The first Prey game, not not the most recent Prey 2017, but like the Prey that came out in 2006, had a scene where there were all these the ghosts of dead children came out to like haunt you or whatever, and you had to shoot them. And they're these, you know, they they look like children, and you're you're shooting kids. And I was like, no, no, this sucks. This is awful. Just like I was just furious that uh that the game would even ask me to do this i haven't played that dragon cancer because of the you know i just i can't oh, take yeah. harm yeah i can't take harm coming to kids that was the scariest thing for me of uh um the walking dead season one again that game comes up but i was always afraid something was going to happen to clementine i just couldn't bear the thought that anything you know i you know i'm fine like lee can jump in the wood chipper and kenny can jump in after him just don't let anything bad happen to clementine so yeah anytime you've got kids getting hurt i'm I, i'm not playing this game that's not fun that's not entertainment um also any anything that's like real world totalitarian i don't mind if it's like space totality you know if it's like space fascists and i'm like you know the sith or like stormtroopers everywhere or lizard men or whatever but if it's like oh you're being oppressed by this real world country or you're stuck in this in this vaguely realistic political situation yeah i'm not, i'm not down for that mm. in, in, unless the gameplay is me um you know picking up a gun and annihilating that that oppressive force i i i didn't um i didn't mind watchdogs legion because like that's the whole gameplay is it just this cartoonishly evil fascist cops that are just like they're asking for it <laughs> just like mustache twirling dipshits the game the game mm -hmm. just p puts them in front of you has them act as aggravating as possible and f you know, okay the, the gun the game gives you an armload of guns and then shows you these agents two-dimensional cardboard cutouts yeah yeah, yeah. And it's just like, so what do you want to do, player? You're free to, you know, it's like, what do you think I'm going to do? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and write an article. It's like, no, of course, I'm going to just go to town on these guys. Um, That's not very deep, but I'm very susceptible to, like, getting a lot of glee out of that. <laughs> But I recognize mm. it's a cheap thrill and easy to set up, you know, easy to accomplish. This is not a clever thing. 
But if it doesn't allow that, then you feel like you're being tortured, right? Your hands are tied and it's just like, ah, get oh, me out yeah. of here. Yeah, exactly. Get me out of here. Alt F4. I don't need this. Mm. For me, it's, it's games that either give you no moral options, like all the options are clearly morally compromised, or gives you, you know, a choice, but really the the clear gameplay optimal choice is the one that's morally corrupt. So I, I'm just like, nah, I, I don't need this. This is, this is not for me. It's interesting because I know a lot of people want that one. They're like, oh, I hate that the, that the most sensible choice is the good choice all the time. That the, 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 the game all, they, they feel it's patronizing that the game sort of like, oh, you saved the kittens. So here's, you know, a bunch of experience points and money. And then that makes evil even more cartoonish because being evil is not only being cruel and destructive, but it's being cruel and destructive for no reason, for no benefit to yourself either. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say. I guess that I, um, I don't have enough faith in my own moral uh, fiber to think that I would be unscathed in exposing myself to that kind of uh, influence, I guess. I kind of, I kind of like it when choice. I mean, in the real world, it's very rare that choices are that black and white. Most choices, right, in right, life exactly, are trade offs. Yeah, and I don't mind like gray morality where it's like, uh, you know, it's not clear what the right choice here is, and so like, right, you know, there's some trade offs, and you know, are you gonna like go back on your word, or you're gonna like, you know, do this thing that's kind of sketchy or whatever it's like okay like you know if you're giving me some 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 real test of my moral judgment then fine but if it's just like hey you know here's the really bad thing are you gonna do it i'm gonna give you a, a dollar and it's like oh no i don't here's the i most, don't want to be taunted here's the best sword in the game all you gotta do is kick this puppy right yeah. exactly it's like okay uh, you know I, I basically like all peter molyneux moral choices yeah oh yeah we don't have to go into that we're, we got it some mailbags to read how would you take the next one dear diecast what are some of your favorite fictional settings in video games and why what distinguishes them from from other ones in the medium that you do not look so favorably on um have a wonderful day andrew so what are my favorite uh game worlds I think for me, it's probably like Legend of Zelda game worlds where it feels like there's just enough of this stuff going on in the world that you can believe it, but it's also fantastical enough that it's not recognizably realistic. Um, I would say here's one where the answer is not The Walking Dead Season 1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that world's not a lot of fun, not my favorite. I don't feel the need to go back to it, even though it was a really good game. I do love the Half-Life world and the Portal world. Mm. Those are just wonderfully constructed things that just I'm always interested to learn more about them and to see them from different angles. Um, yeah, those are really good. I'm, I've never been really that interested in World of Warcraft, even though I played a lot of World of Warcraft back in the day. Um, I am not one of these people that, like, paid attention to the lore. Hmm. I mean, the, the the thing is, there's a big overarching story, which is more or less, you know, a proper story. But then your interaction with that story is on this real micro level of go and kill five boars for this, you know, town guard. And at mm -hmm. that level, when you're when you're interacting on that level, the the story is just atrocious because <laughs> it's not. <laughs> You know, it's not moving the overall plot forward. It's just trying to generate like 10 to 15 minutes of gameplay for you to engage with. Yeah. And from what I, I never read up on the lore much either, but uh, from what I recall, there's like this whole Silmarillion level, like deeply intricate, crazy plot going on. And like you said, at very high levels. Yeah. And it's really big, like, oh, there's the invasion of okay, the demons and the undead, and then they repelled it, and then the world tree and the night elves came in and saved it. And it does. Silmarillion 
is, I mean, maybe not that level of quality, but that style of just sort of very broad, you know, fantastical elements being introduced out of nowhere. Just the, the world sort of being built as the story is being told. Oh, yeah, by the way, there are these here, there's these elves. Yeah, they, they have this amazing power. Oh, there, and there's a world tree that can totally solve this problem. Um, and that exists. <laughs> and you're like, oh, well, I, that's super useful. <laughs> um, I gather for uh, people that are fans of the lore kind of dislike what happened in the last few expansions. Um, they disagree with, so, like, oh, you, this, the way this character was handled didn't make any sense, or this character turning evil was ridiculous, or whatever. Mm. But yeah, I could never get, I could never get into any of it. I seem to I recall never... that one of my brothers was, uh, and some friends, some childhood friends were like into the lore, and they said that when they did the Pandaren expansion, that that was like the end of it, because it was like the whole thing was like this goofy joke that they introduced as canon, and then it's just like, well, come on, we can't take it seriously anymore. Right, and once, yeah, once you introduce that, you can go from The Hobbit to Lord of the Rings, but it's much harder to go from Lord of the Rings to The Hobbit. And it would be harder <laughs> still to go from, like, Lord of the Rings to, like, the color of magic. Like, well, now we can't take any of it seriously. <laughs> right. You're going to go from, right. from Tolkien to Pratchett. And it's like, well, now it's all a joke. Yeah, in the same setting or whatever. And then you're like, okay, and but then the dragons came back. And it's like, no, no, you can't pull that card again. Right, we can't go back to taking it seriously. That was a one-way door you took us through. The thing that's bothering me about this question is I know I have a bunch of answers for it, and I'm blanking out on them right now. Oh, no. Okay, well, uh, Mist. Mist is super cool. Um, oh, that's the that's it. That's it, of course. That's the one I was trying to think of. I love the, the world of Mist. Yes. I knew there was something that was like, Late 90s, early aughts. Yeah, the Mist and Riven. I absolutely love mm. that world where people build worlds by writing in books. It's just the coolest. I, I like how it's presented. I like the characters. It's just so groovy. Makes me happy. Hi, Diecast. There is this game company that I liked, Logic Artists. They're known for their Expeditions series, tactical RPGs, and they released the third title in that series, Rome, after Conquistador and Vikings. Um, the game was released. They announced they won't be doing any RPGs anymore, and instead will be focusing on NFT games. So here's my question. Number one, what in the hell? Number two, do you think there will be any more companies that will do the same thing? Number three, please make them stop. Thanks in advance. Cheers, Derek. <laughs> okay, Derek. We'll see what we can do. Uh, the... NFT thing, I was really puzzled about it until I, like, I didn't even know. I had people asking me, what do you think of NFTs? What do you think of And I'm like, why is this happening? What need is this fulfilling? And it didn't make sense until I watched uh, the Folding Ideas video on NFTs. Mm, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. And I, I have, um, what? I have deep seated ideological differences with Dan from Folding Ideas, but he is a clear thinker and I appreciate his insights. Yes, <laughs> I can. I, I I knew that before I even said this about it. you like, yeah, <laughs> I, I have I have things I disagree with Dan about, too, but he's always just a really has very interesting thoughts. Even when I disagree with it, it's always just real respectful disagreement like you know, it's not like, oh, you're just dumb and wrong. It's like, oh, that's an interesting right, right. way yeah, of looking. He really at thought it. about it, right? And I, his, the first half of that video is a lot of stuff about cryptocurrency that I um, either disagree with or I think is overly reductive. Now. To be clear, mm -hmm. I don't own any cryptocurrency, but I don't think cryptocurrency itself is one giant sham. Um, <laughs> I certainly don't think it's a giant sham to avoid paying taxes, which is how he portrays it. Like, there's a lot going on with cryptocurrency that isn't that. Um, right, right. 
And then the second half, he talks about like art and NFTs and, and like games and how they're kind of tied together in this weird way. Right. And that's the part that where it really clicked for me. And when you think about a lot of people have their money tied up in cryptocurrency, where they supposedly have these, you know, millions of dollars in cryptocurrency, and they're sort of looking for something to do with it. And, oh, something that can be bought with cryptocurrency, a, an asset that you can buy with cryptocurrency, and that that asset is itself like, um, it's not a Ponzi scheme. What's the, the scheme he talks about? Anyway, it, it oh, makes yeah. a lot of sense. You know, when he talks about it's, you know, it's everybody putting their, oh, what is the name of this, this particular kind of hustle? Greater Fool was the one that, that occurs to me, yes. but there was a name for like a pyramid scheme or something. Right, right. But it was a special kind of, yeah, but Greater Fool. And that, that really does make a lot of sense. But that doesn't really, here's the weird thing. Okay, you've got that going on where there's a bunch of people trying to sell NFTs so they can sell you their NFTs so that they can check out of this NFT that they already bought into. It's people trying to exit the pyramid scheme and make sure they're not on the bottom, right? By getting mm -hmm. you to join below them. But then we have video games coming in and getting involved in this. And that is super weird. And I would love to know the rationale between behind video game producers messing around with this stuff i mean can you imagine like a video game rewarding you with stock in the in with penny stocks or something like, <laughs> like that you, sounds a lot like gambling seamus right it's just weird it's just weird that they're messing around with this stuff it's like the, it's like they want to take the gambling idea of loot boxes and mix it with oh we can make it we can make you gamble for stuff and then the stuff you gamble for probably isn't even valuable <laughs> like <laughs> yeah yeah it's very strange i thought we were all getting upset at ea for doing this and now all of a sudden it's a good idea for everybody to do i i don't know how how do we get there right i don't know i i don't know it's very weird to me it, it, the players uh, here's the other thing about it players obviously hate this players hate this nobody likes it nobody wants it it's getting review bombed and they're still pushing it and that's just crazy to me can you imagine car companies <clears throat> come out with a feature you know it's uh you know the feature if you leave the glove box o open it just plays this air horn super loud continuously until you shut the glove box everybody hates it and they just keep adding it to vehicles in fact, you take your car into the shop, <laughs> you take it into the dealership to get it worked on, and they add that feature to it while it's in the shop. Right. You're like, why? I, I was, why are I you immediately doing started this? thinking about all the features in my car that I don't want, that they seem to keep adding to things, like, like the doors that automatically lock when you start moving the car. Like, I don't want that. I want my doors to be mm. able to be opened. That's true, although I've always assumed, maybe I'm wrong, I always assumed that that was like safety mandates from the government. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I, mm -hmm. still don't want I, it. Uh, right, right. But I mean, I don't blame the, the car manufacturer for putting in stuff that people hate if they're forced to by law. But like putting in stuff that people hate that, you know, you don't have to put in there. That makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. the, the one we ran into, we ran into one last week. Uh, my wife and I were out doing, running some errands. And we needed to move from one side of a parking lot to another. All right. That's it. So I got into the car and I had a bunch of stuff on my lap. I, did, you know, that we just got at this other store and we're just going, we're going to be driving at three miles an hour from one side of the parking lot to the other. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I didn't want to have to like stow all this gear so that I could put my seatbelt on. Because okay. I'm just going to get right back out. So I'm like, oh, I won't put on my seatbelt. And it, and as soon as the car began moving, ding, ding, ding. And I'm like, oh, that's going to get old. And then it got more and more intense. And then after like 20 seconds, it got really intense. Like you could not concentrate. You could not talk. It was like, no, you put your seatbelt on right now, mister. And I was absolutely 
just red in the face, enraged, wanting to punch somebody. <laughs> no. Because of course, like, we're moving at three miles an hour. <laughs> like, there's no reason for this. It thinks, yeah. we're, it thinks we're about to jump on the interstate and, oh, you're not wearing your seatbelt. And it made me very angry. Our car did that uh, at one point, the, like the sensor in the, in the seatbelt thing broke. So you could hook your seatbelt up and it still thought that your seatbelt was disconnected. <sighs> Oh no! And uh, it was a little more passive aggressive about it, where like the light would turn on on the dash, but it wouldn't do anything until you've been driving for about like five minutes, and then it would start beeping at you. And so, like you're driving along, you you know just gotten out, you turn on the main road, and then it's like beep 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 beep. It's like whoa, is the car on fire? What's going on? No, no, it just it it's forgotten how to realize that my seatbelt is plugged in. So after that happened a couple times, I just crawled under the seat and hot wired it, so it thought my seatbelt was always plugged in. Right. And I can, okay, that's a really obnoxious feature. It's an obnoxious feature, but I understand why it's there. I mean, it's like, I, w I wouldn't, wouldn't want it in a car that I buy. I wear my seatbelt. And if I'm not wearing my seatbelt, I have a good reason to not be wearing a seatbelt, right? Mm -hmm. I don't need my machinery to tell me what to do to make sure that I do the right thing. I'm an adult, but I suppose maybe this... You know, you, you could make the argument that that saves lives, all right? That's too complicated an argument. I, I don't I don't want to get in that argument. But the point is, like, if there's a feature that was that obnoxious, but it wasn't saving lives, it was just obnoxious for no reason, then you would wonder why car companies put it in there. And that's NFTs. Nobody's making okay, them do I think it. I, can, I think I can make the connection, though, because, like, the reason that those beepers are in the car is because, not because of the law enforcement, like law enforcement guys are sad when they have to like pack body bags, but it doesn't cost them anything really. The people that make car manufacturers put them in is the insurance companies because it lowers the insurance company's overhead. Uh, so, yeah. so basically they're getting paid. Somebody is getting paid to put that feature in. And like the people driving the cars don't really want it, but those aren't really the clients. The clients are the insurance companies. And it's the same thing I think with these RPGs, right? Like the people who are paying the people who are making the RPGs with NFTs in them or whatever, whatever <gasps> NFT games are, I don't even know. The people who are bankrolling the, the game. Yeah. Yeah, they're the guys who own the NFTs. Yes. Oh, so when, when you see Ubisoft stuffing NFTs into some game, what you're seeing is the executives at Ubisoft are messing around with NFTs on the side and want, and they're basically using the game as, as the next fool, the game itself. The, all the, yeah, well, the game, I think the game uh, audience, they're hoping that the game audience right. will buy into this. They're using the, the IP, right, in order to hook people into this so that they can unload their stuff. Oh, that is super... Now I'm mad. <laughs> like, I thought it was just stupidity, but no, it's... Yeah, it's uh, it's predatory. So, uh, in the answers to question number one, uh, number two, probably, and number three, no. Sorry, there's nothing we can do. Um, yeah, the way Dan described it, he made it sound like NFTs would eventually collapse, and I couldn't... Like, I couldn't, I can't argue for or against that. It sounds nice. That would be really great from the perspective of, you know, somebody who doesn't want their games filled with NFT nonsense. But, you know, these schemes are popping up pretty fast. And there's a lot of people that went in on this. I suppose eventually it will burn through. I suppose eventually this fire will burn through its fuel, but it seems like that would take a while. Particularly if you're if some of the fuel is the gaming public, right, being dragged into it. Mm. Wow. No, I am sad. Well, here's one that'll cheer you up, dear Diecast. I hope you're doing well. You ever forget how old you are? Oh no, I was wrong. 
I know it sounds weird, but as I've gotten older, sometimes I find myself in a position where I tell someone my age and I have to quickly do math in my head to make sure I didn't lie to them. I'm embarrassed to admit that last year, my 28th birthday, for a minute or two, I thought I was actually turning 29 until I did the math. So my question is, has this ever happened to you? Or am I just really weird? I mean, people do tell me I always have a great memory. Maybe I'm just surrounded by bigger freaks. And if this has happened to you, is it something that you have eventually grown out of? Keep being awesome, Lino. Thank you again, Lino. Not like that, but I do run into math problems with age where, you know, where I will do bad math because I forget how old I am. Like, I, I don't forget how old I am, but I forget how long it's been. Like, oh yeah, 10 years ago when I was 30. Wait a minute, I'm 50. Oh, right, right. Yeah, like, I make mistakes like that all the time and I have to stop myself. Or, oh yeah, 20 years ago when I was in high school. Oh, wait, that was... I was in high school 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> that's really common. It feels like there are, it, especially the number 10, it feels like there are 10 extra years between where I am now and, let's say, 1990. I always want to say that's about 20 years, and it's, you know, just over 30. Mm -hmm. And any time I have to make calculations across that span of time, I tend to have off by 10 errors. Well, there you go. I I generally don't have those off by 10 errors. I, I think because I keep my resume fairly well updated and I'm like interviewing a lot. And so people are like, oh, well, you know, how long have you been doing this? And so it, in my head, it's like, okay, well, I'm, you know, out of college in 2006. And so it's, you know, 18 years ago or whatever. And uh, now I've done the math wrong, I'm sure. But I uh, like, I can keep that recent so then it's not too hard to keep track of, you know, like how long ago were things. But um, I do actually run into the problem that Lino describes where it's like, how old am I? Uh, let me do the math, <laughs> right? Like, let me do the math real quick because I don't keep that number in my head. For me, the, the career thing is particularly weird because it still feels like this making content on the internet is a new thing I'm doing. This is my new hustle. Like any day mm. now, I might go. I might go back to a cubicle and you know make three D models or write code again. But I've got this new hustle I'm doing. But no, this is you know I've been doing this since two thousand five. Now this is over half my right. career, and I wow. think part of it is the teens went really fast for me. Like just went by so quick. Hmm. It feels like my kids were teenagers for like ten minutes. Like my kids were little. <laughs> My kids were little. My kids were little. They're teenagers. They're grown up. They're gone. And I'm like, what, eh, what happened there? there? There was like some intermediate years that just like blew by. Well, those were all great questions. Thank you to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show and you don't mind waiting for an answer, the email is diecast at Um, That's it. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. Goodbye.